Lopez, keep her covered. Switching frequencies. How come the suits uh, are all floppy and loose? Suits are pressurized. I mean, you've probably made a balloon animal. It's really hard to twist it. it gets hard as nails, and yet their suits are like they just put on some costumes and walked onto the set. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Hadfield, astronaut, fighter pilot, test pilot, and I've been really looking forward to this. Today we're gonna be reviewing space movies from an astronaut's perspective. This is for all mankind. Webster, take point. Get on that freak and tell these guys to get lost. Lopez, keep her covered. Uh. There is so much wrong there that it's just excruciating to watch. The idea of an alternative history where the Soviets with Alexei Leonov were the first to land on the moon, I really think it's a clever uh, possibility for plots. But it very soon, just a few episodes in, everything became sort of cartoonish. <laughs> It sounds like a bunch of actors sitting around a table pretending to be soldiers. Take point and uh, sound off. How come nobody on the American team, not one, speaks a word of Russian? They knew there were going to be Russians there. I used to be a combat fighter pilot with an armed F-18 intercepting Soviet bombers in the Cold War. These are ostensibly trained astronauts and Marines. That's not how anybody's going to behave, especially when the stakes are that high. They recognize the incredible seriousness of of shooting a Soviet, a Russian, you're gonna have to be absolutely sure that there was a threat. Stop! Step away from the case! I write thriller fiction, and in my book, The Apollo Murders, there's a gun on the moon. So I did a lot of research for how would a gun work on the surface of the moon? Guns don't need air. To work. Lack of air would be better because then there'd be no air to slow down the bullet and there's a lot less gravity on the moon. So the, the bullet would go straighter and further, especially a great big high-powered rifle like that. You'd hardly even need to aim. It would go absolutely dead straight, especially for the short distances they were firing them. Jesus, this guy's on fire. It's a hundred percent oxygen inside a spacesuit, so everything burns. We have had a fire inside a spacewalking suit. It was in test at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and even the aluminum was burning inside the suit. Fortunately, there was not a person in the suit. You don't want any sparks to be even possible uh, inside a 100% oxygen environment. This movie is Top Gun Maverick. Control, this is Dark Star. How do you read? Dark Star control loud and clear. How me? Loud and clear. Takeoff pre complete. Ready for APU start. Ready left engine start. I love this movie. I do not know of a better pilot flying movie that has ever been made. Kudos to the people that made this film, and especially to Tom Cruise. That scene at the end where, where Tom's flying a, a, a P-51 Mustang, that's Tom's Mustang. Like, he's a real pilot. There's a delightful little touch that Tom Cruise stuck in here when as he's taxiing out to take off, he says, I have information alpha. Tower, this is Dark Star. We are taxiing with information alpha. What that means is he's listened to the, the recording that tells what the weather is and what runway is active. So the tower doesn't have to repeat it to him. It, it didn't need to be in the movie, but it's real. And, and I just love that it's in there. All right, sweetheart. One last ride. When I was a test pilot, I worked on the engines that are used in, in this scene. I had the very first scramjet mounted on the wingtip of my F-18, and we managed to get it to light, burning hydrogen and, and ambient oxygen. Mach 8.8, 8.9, Mach 9. He's the fastest man alive. Did he say fastest man alive? I'm an astronaut. I've got Mach 25. He gets up to Mach 10 and he just can't help himself. He's got to go a little bit faster. Oh, don't do it. When I was flying an F-18, uh, when we were doing engine testing, we would take it up almost 40,000 feet and just under Mach 2, pretty fast for an F-18. So what would you do if you were at 40,000 feet and just above Mach 2? I would pull back on the stick and go up 
and each time I got a little more confident, a little more brazen, and pushing the envelope even further up to 62,000 feet, way higher than an F-18 is supposed to fly. It's sort of in the nature of a test pilot, uh, but it's tempered by, okay, how far could I push this? And you can see Tom doing that. If I made it to Mach 10, the 10.1, you know, it's such a little change, it'll be all right. In reality, that wouldn't have wrecked the vehicle. A few more tents of Mach, the vehicle wouldn't know. High-speed ejections are not pretty. I mean, they, they often kill the pilot. And so for the airplanes that fly really fast, they actually have an ejection pod. The whole front of the airplane ejects or separates. And so if you had a problem where the vehicle was breaking up, you could eject and that whole escape pod would separate from the vehicle and come down under a parachute. The fact that Tom Cruise somehow survives this breakup, I think it means that in this SR-72 uh, Dark Star, they must have had an escape pod. This is life. I was emailing actually back and forth with Ryan Reynolds while he was filming this. The weightlessness is actually done really well. He was working really hard on that. He wanted to make it look realistic. It's pretty convincing. They did a nice job of that. But the fundamental idea is, is just so far-fetched. It just makes me wince. Sorry, Ryan. Suggestions? Get an oxygen candle. Okay, cool. An oxygen candle. That's not a bad idea. An oxygen candle is this canister. It looks like a small beer keg, and it's got a certain chemical in it that if you heat up one end, the chemical reaction releases great amounts of oxygen. It's kind of like an emergency oxygen supply. He smashes it against a handrail, and you hear glass tinkling. Imagine what shards of glass would be like without gravity. You, you don't have glass on board a spaceship. It's not an oxygen candle. It's like, touch him with the 100 watt light bulb. Any suggestions? What about the incinerator? I, I like that. All right, genius. Here, manual override. Thank you. That's a flamethrower inside a spaceship. One of the worst things that can happen on a space station is fire. It's one of the three big emergencies on a spaceship. A puncture where you're depressurizing, a contaminated atmosphere that you can't breathe anymore, and a fire. You wanna have no chance at all of an open flame happening on board a spaceship. The space station is festooned with smoke alarms, but here we have Rory <laughs> filling the entire spaceship with flame. Not one alarm goes off. They are not doing their, their job at all. But what an interesting alien. Completely different. Looks sort of like a little self-propelled jellyfish, starfish kind of thing. There's no reason to think that life on Mars would have uh, evolved exactly the same way it would on Earth. If we do find alien life somewhere else, we have to expect it to be radically different than us. It's going to think differently. It's going to have a different set of objectives. It might live in an entirely different environment. Than us. One of the cool recent discoveries is that every star has a planet. We can count stars and we can count galaxies. So suddenly we have a rough idea of how many planets there are in the universe. It's at least septillion planets, which is such a huge number, it's essentially infinite. So with 14 billion years and an infinite number of planets, there's got to be life out there in the universe. We're researching, we're exploring the universe. But so far, the only life we have ever seen is from Earth. This is Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. Our best guess is that you can live outside of a spaceship without a spacesuit for 30 seconds, really no problem. But beyond about a minute and a half, there's going to be stuff happens to you that does permanent, irreversible, and, and deathly damage. 90 seconds and uh, you're a satellite. Within about 15 seconds, all the oxygen that is in your blood will have now come through your lungs the other way and you will have breathed it out. So in about 15 seconds, you have blood without enough oxygen in it. And when it gets up to your brain, you'll go unconscious. You can see his face swelling up. That's real. If you popped your helmet off in space, sure, your lungs would, would sort of collapse, but also 
your, your blood would fizz, like opening a can of Coke and release the pressure and suddenly there's bubbles in your blood and in your cheeks and in all of your flesh and you're gonna swell up. Not as much as he's swelling up here. Suddenly he's got frost on his face. It wouldn't happen like that. There's no water on your face. It's not gonna instantaneously freeze. You got a lot of thermal mass. It's like sticking a, a big roast in the freezer. You know, it doesn't instantaneously freeze. It takes a while. Most of the stuff that's happening inside your body, but it's really hard to show that to the movie audience. So that's why they sort of exaggerated what's happening to his face. I think it would have been better if this had happened to Groot. I think Groot would have just like flown out of that one ship and gone Groot and then been on board the other ship and you know, wouldn't have been any big deal. Neil. You are dark on the rock. This is Transformers, dark of the moon. You have 21 minutes. They changed the purpose of the very first uh, human moon landing, Apollo 11, to land next to this crashed alien ship. Of the 135 space shuttle flights, 11 of them were classified. And the stuff that was going on was not broadcast. They were doing stuff for uh, the Department of Defense and everything was at some level of security and secrecy. If we were taking up one of the, the military's uh, payloads or doing experiments on behalf of the military, then that would be a classified mission and the public wouldn't hear a thing, just like is shown here in the Transformers movie. I have to clarify one thing. There is no dark side of the moon. The moon rotates as it goes around the sun. So uh, a day on the moon lasts about two weeks. And sometimes the other side of the moon, it's in the bright light. So it really shouldn't be called the dark side of the moon. It should just be called the other side of the moon. We are not alone after all, are we? No, sir. We're not alone. I've been around pilots my whole life. I was an astronaut for 21 years and no one, no one that I have ever met has ever seen a UFO. It's fun to think about. There's a lot of people that think it's worth looking into. That's fine. I hope we do find evidence, even one little fossil, you know, on Mars. That, that'll be quite a revelation when next time you look up at the stars to realize, hey, we finally have proof that we're not alone, but we're not there yet. This is the expanse. I'm sorry the gravity of a real planet hurts, but it's appropriate. You wish to hurt Earth. The Earth that is now crushing your weak belter lungs and your fragile belter bones. I really like the expanse. It, it just sort of extrapolates where we are now, the type of things we're doing, our technology, the way we behave, and takes that out into the future. And how is it gonna change the fundamental nature of human life itself to be multi-planetary? What would it be like to be a miner on an asteroid? What if you'd been born uh, without gravity? How would your body develop? The belter in this scene was born and raised somewhere besides Earth. Sex in space, uh, as far as I know, never happened yet, but eventually, uh, there will be sex in space, and eventually it will lead to conception. We do not know if a human being, right from birth through adulthood, can properly develop anywhere but Earth. The muscles, the, the density of the bones, the interplay between your balance system and your eyes, it, it would evolve differently. All the little ligatures and, and the musculatures, you know, they would all be wildly different if you didn't have the constant weight lifting task of living on Earth, while your body was forming itself. And it may be that if we are born somewhere besides Earth, we can never come back to Earth. I don't think it's correct that suddenly everyone would get taller. Our height is driven by our genetics. Taller people give birth to taller children. I think if you look at his body here, it's pretty representative. He looks wimpy, looks flaccid. It looks like a body that hasn't been fighting gravity. For someone who's never lived under gravity, it'd be like tying hundreds of pounds of weight to your body and, and like being on the rack, sort of, and having to, uh, to put up with it just by gravity itself. When I returned to Earth from my third space flight, I'd been in space for almost half a year. Getting used to gravity again, even for someone who was born and raised on Earth, was really hard. My heart had shrunk. My balance system had completely adapted to not having gravity. So suddenly I was super dizzy and, and couldn't focus. And if I tipped my head back, I could have sworn I was doing backflips just because I had adapted to a different gravity field than the one we have on Earth. I'd forgotten that your lips and your tongue have weight. 
It was so weird when I started talking back on earth. I was like, what the heck is going on? My tongue is being pushed to the bottom of my mouth. You know, it's just even the little subtle things were different. So imagine what it would be like if you'd never been here before. This is F9, the fast saga. Oh my God! I don't want to die! Ignition! Like a billion other people on Earth, I really like the Fast and Furious series. It's just almost just purely a cartoon, but unavoidably fun to follow and watch it. They launch off the back of that airplane, that big, like, it's like a C-141, but with two engines. Their engines fire, and now they're rocking into space. And like 30 seconds later, they're in orbit. It took me eight and a half minutes. So they really went fast. You know, they were getting crushed. This is a 1984 Pontiac Fiero flying in space. Tell me you know how to work the thrusters. Tej, numbers is what you do, right? Driving is what I do. I haven't driven a Fiero uh, in a while, but I've flown some rocket ships and they don't actually have a transmission that you <laughs> shift. That's not how rocket ships work, but it's okay. I understand it. It's a Fiero, what else are you gonna do? But I love the scene when those two guys and you see it reflected in their visors, are suddenly actually seeing Earth from space. The beauty of that and the wonder of it, that they're emoting there, it, it feels just like that. Suddenly, all of the blue is below you. You're out in the eternal blackness, and all of life is laid out there on this beautiful curving arc of the world under them. And I'm really pleased that they, they put that into the movie and then portrayed it so well. This movie is Space Cowboys. First one to pass out buys a beer tonight. Get on. Is this thing moving? I don't know. Doesn't seem to be moving to me. The life of an astronaut is one of simulation. I served as an astronaut for 21 years. I was in space for six months. So for 20 and a half years, I trained and prepared and simulated and got ready for spaceflight. And one of the things we did was fly a centrifuge. A centrifuge is just a little cockpit on the end of a long arm and you spin it. And by spinning it, you can sort of get extra force on your body like you're a ball on the end of a string. You're a push over, Frank. You know, I do believe it's moving. The purpose of a centrifuge is not to make the astronauts black out. The maximum G load that the shuttle pulled was three, three times the gravity that you're feeling right now. And you don't have to spin your centrifuge that fast to get up to 3G. The G-force that they're subjecting themselves to in this clip is, is completely unrealistic. When they show that sped up video of that centrifuge spinning, the guys would have been turned to jello on the floor of the centrifuge. The whole centrifuge would have come apart spinning that fast. And yet there's Tommy Lee and Clint sitting there. And for some reason, they're both leaning to the left. If you suddenly weigh 15 times normal, you want to sit straight upright. So all this huge weight of your head being crushed by the centrifuge is being supported by your spine. If they went over like that, they just crumple like an accordion, you know, down under their left hip. A lot of astronauts, especially early on in the shuttle era, they were military fighter pilot test pilots because you need those skills. You have to have gotten the university degrees, had all that thousands of hours of flying, and then practiced and simulated and learned so that you can go do something with an airplane nobody ever did before. But we are not thrill seekers. We're not adrenaline junkies. We are definitely not cowboys. You need careful and thoughtful and well-trained and disciplined and teamwork-oriented people. Otherwise, you're all gonna die. But, you know, it's space cowboys, so you know, saddle up. Let's ride this Bronco. Break off the attack. The shield is still up. This is Return of the Jedi. Pull up. All craft, pull up. Star Wars was a revelation when it first came to the screen in the late 1970s. To recognize just how groundbreaking all of this technology was, to be able to, to have these visuals. As a fighter pilot, I mean, you're just, your head is on a swivel because the, the threat is all around you and it's above you and it's below you. And these guys are always just looking straight ahead. They never look down. They don't roll their ship upside down to see. Everybody just sort of magically knows what everybody else is doing all the time. The Admiral, he's sitting there in an easy chair in front of a bay window 
somehow directing the fight. I mean, the distances in space are huge. Things are tens or twenties of miles away from him. Then how about everything that's happening behind him? It's a trap. Space is disorienting just by its very nature. I mean, which direction is up if you're floating through space? It's completely arbitrary. And if you're gonna to talk to somebody else, the two of you have to establish a common reference frame. Like you could say, away from the Earth or away from this planet. But you've got to get some sort of reference frame that the two of you share. Otherwise, your, your communications to each other are just going to be meaningless. But this is Star Wars. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to critique it for its technical accuracy. It was a huge, new, exciting way to experience the rest of the universe. And I still feel that way. When I was a kid, it was stories and movies and television shows that allowed me to see things that didn't exist yet, to imagine stuff, to dream of doing things that directly led to my life as a fighter pilot and a test pilot and an astronaut. It's lovely that we have this huge volume of stories being told. These great images, our ability to imagine stuff, to allow us to explore things that are still impossible. Because a lot of the things that are in these movies, they're just only impossible right now. These are things that we might be able to do in the future. So it's been a lot of fun reviewing them, but I'm really more interested in the reality of what people are gonna do in the future as the result of having been inspired by these movies.